Well, good evening. So glad you could join me for Midweek with Pastor Brad. It's going to be a great time together as we open God's Word and just share together. You know, we've been in a series on Sunday mornings called uh, Rescue Story, and uh, we're getting ready to kind of wrap that series up here in the next couple of weeks. Um, but, you know, this past week we are talking about Rahab, the harlot, who God used. And, and we, we, we were talking about uh, this, and, and again, we're going to talk about this this next week as well on Sunday, uh, this idea of faith. You know, um, how, how are we rescued? We are rescued by faith. And we, we flipped over Sunday into Hebrews chapter 11, and we said that, you know, we see Israel crosses the Red Sea, I think it's in, in verse 29, and then there's 40-year gap of no faith. And that's when the children of Israel were in the, in the wilderness. And then in verse 30, we see it says Joshua, you know, had faith in going to Jericho. And then the verse, I think it's verse 31 that says, and Rahab uh, had faith when she hid the, the spies. And so this is this idea of faith. And this next Sunday, we're going to be kind of journeying into this idea that uh, just, uh, just the knowledge of the gospel, just the knowledge about religion is the word I'm going to use a lot on Sunday, is not enough to save a person. You know, it's, it is faith, but it is a working faith. You know, proof or evidence of your salvation is a faith that works. And I want to make, make a very clear distinction before we get into our text this morning, which will be, if you want to go ahead and turn there, in James chapter 2. James chapter 2, and then we're also going to look over in Ephesians chapter 2. Um, I think there's a very, two very important kind of, kind of context of verses that I want us to look at in, the, in this idea. And so we want to look at, I want to be very clear and distinguish that it is faith that saves us. But once we are saved, our faith will be proven by the evidence of the works in our life. And James is actually dealing with this issue in James chapter 2. And, and the reason I want to kind of go here this morning is because I want to set the stage for those of you who are joining me for Sunday. And we will talk a whole lot more in detail about this on Sunday. Uh, but I wish, I wish I had time on Sunday to get into this. So this is just me kind of setting the stage ahead of time. It, it, is that I believe that this is a very big problem in America today. I would say specifically, I think it's even a bigger problem if we want to go regionally in the South, where there's a church on every corner, um, literally two of the most churched counties in the United States of America are found in Etowah County, where Gadsden is located, and Calhoun County, where Anniston is located. There's more churches per capita in those two counties than there are in any other part of the United States. And you would say, well, that's great that we have a lot of churches. And I would say, absolutely, it's great. The culture has been saturated with religious activity, religious talk, and it seems that everyone in Alabama or everyone in this, you know, in this region of the Bible Belt has been connected to a church at some point in their life. They've had some kind of spiritual experience. And, and it's almost as if uh, in this context of where we live, that we almost become nominal Christians at birth. But what do I mean by that? In name only. We're Christian in our name. Well, friend, I want to tell you something. We, you're not born into Christianity. You're not. You're born into sin. But yet it's almost like if we go through the religious routine and the religious motions of the culture around us, then we feel like we've done enough to be received by God. You see, it's almost as if we believe that knowledge and making some kind of commitment or public commitment seems to be enough for us to have peace about our eternity. What do I mean by that? Well... Just to be honest with you, there are people who show up to churches like ours and others, and they make a decision, they pray a prayer, they go to a baptistry, they might attend for a month or so, or maybe not, and then we don't 
know where they are. We try to reach out to them, try to connect them, try to pull them back into the church. And, it's, and then we hear stories that they're just back out in the world. You know, they're not going to connect to another church. It's not like they hurt their feelings were hurt here or something go well here. It's like they needed to turn over a new leaf and they tried to do that. And then that didn't, that didn't fulfill them. So they just went out and, you know, began to do what they used to do again. And then someone goes and talks to those people and say, well, you know, have you ever given your life to Jesus? Oh, yeah, yeah, I've done, I've already done that. You know, I, 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 I prayed a prayer there at that First Baptist Church, and I, you know, I was baptized by Preacher Johnson, and, and I've, I, yeah, I've done all that. I was like, well, okay, that's great. Well, why aren't you in church now? Well, you know, I just, that's just not for me, you know. Well, well, what about your relationship with God? Well, you know, I made that decision, and I've already settled that, and, you know, I'm, gonna, I'm just, you know, I'm okay with God now, and I'm just going to do live my life how I want to live my life. And, and story after story like this is what comes to mind. And, and I can put names with these stories. I mean, in 22 years or one years of vocational ministry now, like um, I, I can tell you names of people who are here and gone or there and gone uh, really quick and who made some kind of spiritual decision, but yet it was, it was an empty decision, at least at the surface it appears. We, and that's where we come in here is, is that's a concern because do we have a lot of people walking around who think they've been saved, who are really lost? Who, do we have a lot of people who are walking around that have convinced themselves that they're okay with God, that he's going to allow them into heaven one day when yet they've not surrendered their life to Jesus? You see, because the gospel demands so much more than a prayer, the gospel demands of us so much more than a baptism, the gospel demands of us a life change. I, mean, I could flip through story after story through the New Testament. When people came to Christ, their life changed. In fact, Jesus said, he's like, those people who put their hands to the plow, this is in the Gospel of Luke, those people who put their hands to the plow and look back, they're not fit for the kingdom. I say, what? What are you talking about? Well, those people that make an empty commitment and then turn their back on God and go their own way, they're not fit for the kingdom. James deals with that here. Paul deals with that in Ephesians chapter 2. And so I want to read it to you real quickly. I'm just going to read a few verses out of this and, and, um, and share my heart with you. But there in verse 14 of James chapter 2, James says, What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Let me translate. Someone says that they've been saved in Jesus, but there is no evidence of that salvation. It's, and he asked the question, can faith save him? He gives a couple of illustrations, but I want to skip over to verse 20. But do you want to know, O oh foolish man, that faith without works is dead? So James answers his own question there in, in verse 20. O oh foolish man, do you not know that faith without works is dead? What does dead mean? No life. What does it mean from, from a spiritual perspective? No spiritual life. What is James clearly saying here? If there's not a connection between your faith and the evidence of that faith, then there's no spiritual life. And then James begins to go through the Old Testament, which is why I wanted to pick out this passage of Scripture because it's right what we're preaching on Sunday mornings. He goes through and gives the illustrator of Abraham in verse 21. If was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? Faith, verse 22, you see that faith was working together with works. And by works, faith was made perfect. It was made complete is what that word means. Literally, because there was evidence of the faith, it proved his relationship with God. Verse 24 says, you see that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. Verse 25, we get another illustration. Likewise, this is where we were Sunday. Likewise, was not Rahab the harlot also justified, there she is being identified again as her, her identity is wrapped up in her sin, right? Was Rahab the harlot also justified, was not she justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way? 
Paul, uh, James again is saying there's a connection. You see that? There's a connection between faith and works. Works does not save you. Faith saves you. Works proves your salvation. Works is evidence of your salvation. Verse 26, for as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Very interesting passage of scripture that we see here. I want us to flip over and see what Ephesians chapter 2 says. In verse 8, we again get this, this idea of faith and works, faith and good works. So I want, to just, I want to just take a look at it. Verse 8 in chapter 2 of Ephesians, Paul is writing to the church at Ephesus, and he's giving them some direction on grace and faith for salvation. But I want you to notice how he ends this conversation about what we were created for and prepared for. Verse 8, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves... It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Now, we stop here and we would say that the Apostle Paul and, the, and James, the brother of Jesus, would be at, at, an, at a um, standstill between each other in an argument based upon what faith, and, what faith and works, how they play a part into salvation. But they don't, they're, they're not, they're actually saying the same thing. They're not saying something different because the Apostle Paul goes on. For we are his workmanship in the present. We are. We are currently his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus for good works. For good works in the present. Which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. What is Paul saying? Paul is saying we were created for good works. And it's only by God. Grace that we are saved through faith. Grace. God gives us something that we don't deserve, which is Jesus. We're saved by grace, which is Jesus. And the only way we come to Jesus is through faith. Not of works, lest anyone could boast in their salvation. The work of salvation was accomplished by Jesus. The proof of our salvation, the evidence of our salvation is found in the workmanship, the in in the good works that God created us to live in in the present. So these these scriptures are not at odds against one another. These men were not been at odds over the concept of faith working together with works to prove salvation. So I kind of want to put a bow on this 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 evening. What does that mean? For those people who made some kind of profession, but they didn't get a possession. I'm going to use that phrase Sunday, so I'll try it out on you guys on Wednesday night. Profession without a possession. People who say, hey, I trust God. I mean, Jesus had a lot to say about this in the Sermon on the Mount. He said, there'll be many who say unto me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not do, 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 right? Did we not, we, we professed you as Lord, but, but, but there's no real, there was no real heart change, no life change. So what about these people, like I gave the illustration of earlier, that were, put their hand to the plow and they look back. Jesus said they're not fit for the kingdom. Paul says, sure, grace is by faith, but we are saved, so we'll work. James says, your faith works together with your works to prove your works, prove your salvation. And this concept is on and on and on. The disciples in the early gospels all left everything they had to follow Jesus. They didn't make a decision. Jesus didn't, Jesus didn't come to make, help people make decisions. Jesus came to help people make, to, to make disciples. He came to make followers. And this morning, excuse me, this evening, I want you to know that when you give your life to Jesus, when you get saved, you're surrendering yourself to Christ. It's, the, it's actually the concept that's preached from the New Testament, all through the New Testament, that when you come to Jesus, you come to die to yourself. You come to die to yourself, take up your cross and follow him. You don't come to pray a prayer or just be dunked in a baptistry. 
You don't come just to attend church. You don't come just to, for any of those reasons, you come to die to yourself and live for Christ. And it's the example that we get over and over again all throughout the New Testament. But somehow, in the context of the culture in which we live now, in the Bible Belt, we have cheapened the gospel to be pray a prayer, shake a preacher's hand, get in a baptistry, and go live your life how you want. It's just not the gospel. It's, it's just not the real gospel. It's a fake. It's a false. And we would say, you know, most of us would say, listen, oh, we don't want the false gospel being taught or preached or lived out in our churches. Well, we don't. But it would, it's almost just, a, just like if Islam was being, if we were teaching the, you know, teaching Islam in the church today, those people, if we're teaching that, we're teaching an empty religion. We're teaching people the wrong thing, and they're going to die one day and go to hell. The friends, the reality is, is so many people have gotten a cheapened picture of the gospel from the Baptist churches even, and they've been made to feel like it's okay for them just to come and turn over a new leaf and go back and live their life as we want, and it's just foreign to the New Testament. So I invite you, what what kind of relationship, what kind of what kind of relationship do you have? I mean, with with spiritual things, with Jesus. I mean, is it a yeah? I met him one time. I I told him that I believed in him one time, and now I'm okay with God. Or is it I've surrendered my life and I'm following him? You see, because there's a distinct difference between those two things. One of those leads to eternal life. And one of those leads to not fit for the kingdom of God. Friend, I hope this has kind of give you something to think about today. I hope it encourages you in your faith if you have a relationship with Christ. And honestly, I pray today that it will convict you if you do not have an intimate relationship with Christ where you surrendered yourself to follow after him. And I look forward on Sunday morning to fleshing this out even more as we look at a rescue story of the Apostle Paul, Saul, rescued on the road to Damascus. We're going to look at that Acts chapter, I believe it's chapter 9, and then we're going to flip over to Philippians chapter 3. And we're going to see how religion will leave you empty, but a relationship will, it will leave you fulfilled and, and at peace with God. It's going to be a great Sunday, and so I want to invite you to come and be a part of that. I look forward to preaching God's word. I look forward to worshiping with fellow believers with you uh, here on campus or, or online. Listen, we're having a lot of folks come back to church and a lot of, a lot of guest families. Uh, I want to encourage you to be friendly, meet new people, help them connect with what God is doing in and around our campus here at First Baptist and in our community. Uh, people are looking for a place to connect, and our church is a great place for that to happen. I know we're filled with wonderful people, and so I know if you can... Get out there and begin to, to stretch yourself and meet some new people. You'll be really blessed to connect with some, some great folks here at First Baptist Hazel Green. It's going to be a great day. Um, also on Sunday, we have a Discover Lunch planned. If you are a guest family or you know of a guest family, please encourage them to come and be a part of Discover Lunch. You say, what is that? Well, Discover Lunch is a time that our staff uh, provides a meal and we get to interact with new families into our church and tell them more about First Baptist. Tell them about our purpose and why we exist and how they can get involved. And so we want to invite people to come. That's immediately following our worship service this Sunday on May 2nd. Upstairs in the fellowship hall, we're having taco salad. We love for new folks who have not connected to First Baptist to be a part of that. If you can be, if you want to be a part of that, please email the church office here. I believe that's info at hazelgreenfbc.org. Um, you can send the church a private message on Facebook, however the best way it is for you to connect uh, to let us know you want to be involved. We would love to have you. We would love for reservations to be in by the uh, middle of the day tomorrow on Thursday uh, so we can make preparation for that meal. Um, and then uh, also, it's immediately following service tomorrow, we have an information meeting about our trip to Israel. I cannot wait. Beth and I cannot wait to host this trip to Israel at the end of January of 2022. That sounds like a long way off, but in reality, we're about 10 months away from that trip now, 
and uh, it's going to be here before we know it. And I cannot wait to lead you on a trip of a lifetime where we encounter Jesus in a way that you've never encountered him probably before. As you walk the streets that Jesus walked, as you go to the places, as you get the opportunity to be baptized in the Jordan and ride a boat on the Sea of Galilee and eat fish that uh, off the off the off the um, on the beach there uh, that Peter would have would have eaten. Uh, I mean, so much, so much more. Walking through the streets of Jerusalem and on the journey that Christ took on the cross, um, just so many things that you're going to get to experience on that trip. I would love for you to come go with us. Uh, if you want more information about that trip, uh, you can come to that meeting uh, on Sunday. Uh, it will be in the Student Center, and we'll have a very brief uh, 15 to 20 minute uh, meeting there, which I inform you about the details of that trip. And then uh, I would ask you to stop by if you're interested and just sign your name on the information sheet in the foyer. And I believe it'll be very helpful uh, for, for you to go ahead and get signed up, even if you just are interested in the trip. So you can get on that email and I can begin to send more and more information out. Uh, I know it's going to be a great, great trip. Listen, there's a lot of other things going on in our church, a lot of exciting things. And so make sure you check out your uh, email that comes out today, um, your newsletter that will come out, lots of information about what's happening in the church. And so we're looking forward to seeing how God continues to bless us as a faith family. I want to pray for you, and I want to encourage you uh, in, this, in this time in prayer. So would you join me? Father, we bow now thanking you for the beautiful, beautiful week you've given us. The weather has been so wonderful. We're so thankful to see the seasons change and uh, see your handiwork. Uh, Lord, I'm just so thankful for these folks who have joined me today. Maybe there are some who are struggling with whether or not they really receive Christ as their personal Savior, or maybe they just went through some motions, religious motions. Father, I, I pray that this time of devotion has helped them be able to see that there's a connection between faith and works, and our works prove our salvation. And there should be evident, evidence. God, you told us, uh, Jesus did in the Sermon on the Mount, that uh, we should know a tree by its fruit. And so, Lord, I pray that we can look and evaluate our lives and see that there is fruit in our lives that is evident of the salvation that we have. Uh, a, a faith that works is a faith that pleases you and that confirms that we really are children of yours. So, Lord, I just thank you so much for blessing us today. And this time, I pray you would encourage each one that's been tuned in. Bless our church family, praying for those that are in need, God, who have sickness or surgery or recovery, who have lost loved ones in their family over the past uh, weeks. And Lord, we just pray that you would continue to minister and strengthen, God, each one. We look forward to gathering together on the Lord's Day to worship. And we look forward to that day even now. And Lord, we pray you keep us safe until we return together. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. God bless you. And I pray you have a wonderful rest of your week.